For most of us, finding our seat after the break has been a relatively simple process. Some of us take a little longer, but all of us know where we are seated. You know your position in the space, you know where your friends are, and your brain does this for you. It does this for you on a daily basis. It computes complex information on a millisecond basis. It decodes the world for you, so it makes your experience of the world. Now, just like you train your body, you go to the gym, you do a sport, what if we had access to tools that could accelerate the ability of the brain to learn and adapt? This could be a healthy brain, like you and me. You want to learn the golf sport. You want to learn tennis. You want to learn to play the piano, and you want to do this quick. Or it could be an injured brain, where you basically have to relearn skills that you've known for a while. And this is a reality for millions of stroke patients, brain injury patients, who suffer with severe movement and cognitive deficits. So these are people who go from one day to the next and not being able to pick up a glass of water, right? These are tasks that we take for granted, like finding our seat. So it is a serious problem. Over the last few years, uh, we worked on a platform, a multimodal platform, that combines a lot of virtual reality, neuroscience, brain imaging, some gamification into one mixing pot, to build an interface that can alleviate this pain, that can really accelerate recovery. Let's talk about stroke for a bit. Stroke is a serious threat. It has a huge socioeconomic burden associated with it. Imagine each year, there's around 15 million patients who have a stroke. That translates into a stroke every 45 seconds. A stroke every 45 seconds. And every three minutes, there's a stroke-related fatality. So it's a serious problem. And another trend that's threatening is that this is growing. There's almost a 180% jump in the populations that are susceptible to stroke. And you have people having strokes in their 30s. These are guys going from day one being extremely healthy, good lifestyles, and the next day they're pretty much dependent for everything, even to button up their shirt, right? So it's a serious problem. And the last thing we need to consider is the economic side of it. This is a huge financial burden, especially in the current economic climate in the United States and Western Europe alone, we're spending more than $100 billion each year. It's lost in stroke care. So something's got to change. Nothing's evolved in the last 50 years, in the last six years. We're still doing the same thing we've been doing the last six years. Imagine in 2014. So there's a need. There's a need for a change. Now, let's talk about the root, the patient himself. Right? Let's take John or Jane, a typical 40, 50-year-old individual, right? has a stroke. What happens? What is their access? What are their pain points? What do they have right now as access, right? What typically happens is the next day you get into an acute rehabilitation phase, you're in an intensive care unit. And all John does is wait. He has an injury and he waits. He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting. He's waiting for help. He needs a therapist to come in. He needs a caregiver. He needs a family member to come by him. But nothing's happening. All he's doing is sitting and waiting. And the real problem behind this is the dependence, because you only have so many qualified therapists, right? The number of patients far outnumber the number of therapists who can help them. So in phase one, the cornerstone now, in 2014, is still physical therapy, manual therapy. And all this while, John is losing the ability of the brain to recover, the vital window where the earlier you get in, the better your chances are. He's just, waiting this, uh, he's just wasting this waiting. As time moves on, four weeks have gone by. He's been shipped to different units in the clinic. He does not see any recovery. He has a few other op options right now, right? There's robotic exoskeletons. There's big devices. These are complex devices, expensive. But all they're doing is moving his arm, the paralyzed arm, let's say, for 15 minutes. He still needs therapists to come in and move him to the facility. At the end of the day, it's 20 minutes. He's back in his seat. He's waiting. So the motivation's gone, does not see any results, starts getting expensive for the family, for him, for the hospitals. He's shipped home. He finds the closest clinic that's to his home, and once in a while, he goes, plays a game. They're not therapeutically effective. They don't have diagnostics. At the end, he gives up. That is really the case for 80% of the population. They give up. They learn to live with the handicap. And that, I think, is not acceptable. 
So what can we do about this? We, we've learned the spectrum, and when we were looking at this, we said, hang on, something's not right. None of these guys are actually looking at the brain, the root cause. Right? All of them build these solutions, but no one's looking at how can you activate the brain? How do you bring the brain in the loop on a daily basis so you can tailor a solution for John to get better? So when we looked at it, we said, OK, this could be a game changer, and let's see how. Now, why do you want to bring the brain in the game? All of us are somehow built differently. We have different personalities, different tastes. Uh, we react differently to the same stimuli. Uh, we like different things. And that's because this guy up there decodes the world for you, for your experience, right? But despite all its sophistication, the brain's organized in a beautiful way. You listen to me speak. You listen to music. You listen to sounds in your daily lives. There's an area in the brain that lights up, that pretty much lights up for the stimuli. So this could be every day, right? Everyday life. As we move on, let's move on to vision, a more complex process. You see objects, you see shapes, uh, you see faces, people, your car. There's an area in the brain that lights up for this. And the same thing translates into movement. When you move, and I move my left hand or my right hand, as you see on the avatar behind me, when I move my left, there's a part on the right side that controls this movement. Now, this is interesting, because science has shown that if I could observe the movement, I would recruit similar neural pathways. So what this would mean is, if you saw me picking up a glass of water 10 times, and you were observing this, we would be sharing and activating the same brain areas. And that's interesting for stroke patients, because imagine a stroke patient, or John, who has a right brain injury, right? He cannot move his left. But what he can do is move his right. And what we're doing now with the virtual reality technology is capturing the motion and mapping it onto an avatar on the paralyzed side. So John's sitting in his bed, and he's moving. So that what you're seeing is the right stroke, the left hand doesn't move. But John can move his right, and then now activate the brain areas that are responsible for the paralyzed limb, sitting in his bed. He doesn't need anyone else. So that's the premise. So when we realized this, we said, OK, we know the spectrum. We know the pain points. We know we need to bring the brain in the game. And now we're going to go about building a solution for John. So what does John need? John needs to start early. Because he's had an extremely active lifestyle, he doesn't like being dependent, right? He needs something that's by his bedside, and he can start practicing. And that's something we need to provide. John needs to maximize practice. At this part, it's not just about John, it's about the family, it's about the therapist. They need him to move on, they need him to practice. What the therapists need is diagnostics. It cannot be guesswork anymore. It cannot be a one-size-fits-all approach. You cannot just go in and say, OK, I think you're a little better than yesterday. No. If you went and told John that, John, yesterday you were 10 centimeters, and today I see you're 25, that's value. He realizes it. And that's motivation. Motivation is key. So they need objective markers. And last thing that's important is, it's all fun and nice if you can get John to practice. right? Everyone's happy. But he's got to learn the skill. He's got to retain it and transfer it to his daily life. Because he's going to go home one day and he's got to open the door. He's got to pick up a glass of water. He's got to button up his shirt. So learning a skill, retaining it, and transferring it is important. So we went about putting all of this into one part. And we said, let's see what we can make. What are the platforms we can make? So what you're seeing behind me is two platforms. We built one that can actually be wheeled beside the bedside, and one that he can take home. You'll see a few videos next where I'm going to talk to you about how the technology itself works, but you get the idea. You need the continuity, something that goes right from day number one and goes all the way home. And he's always connected. John could be in Tokyo. You know, his physician could be in Switzerland. And that's the idea. So the first step we had to take uh, when we went about building this is the prototype and testing phase. Building a medical technology has a lot of steps, and you will see it. And here we had to say, OK, we validate the technology, we validate safety, we validate the clinical efficacy, and we see how John can actually use this. So what you're seeing behind me is now we're validating the science itself. So in the acute phase, this is when he can move his right hand, let's say. He's moving his left, he sees his right. He's independent, he has a feedback, and it's, there's some gamification in it. 
he's motivated. If he's tired, he stops. When he's ready, he plays again. Subacute phase slowly moves his paretic side. He starts getting better. It's different skill. So this is not just a game, right? There's a game based on a cognitive paradigm. So we're trying to elicit a certain movement skill, a certain brain area. When he goes home, different other skills. And this can keep going on. But he's connected. You know, he's connected all the time. He feels empowered. That's the idea. So once we go through this phase and we say, all good and done, technology works, works in the hospital scenario, what next? To take this product to John, there's a hundred other steps we needed to go through. And that was a shocker for us. Uh, but when you make it, it's fun. So what we've now been able to do after all these steps is bring this into hospitals where patients can use this on a daily basis. It is scary because it's no more in your control. You know, it's out there, it's got to work every single time. But it's great. Once the patients do this, they use this, they get better, it's fantastic. The whole journey is worth it. Uh, when I started a few years ago, when I was a, let's say, a neuroscientist and an engineer, and I got into the clinic for the first time, I was shocked. I was shocked the way they dealt with the patients. They, they still had tools from literally the 60s. It was amazing. And as an engineer, I said, this cannot be, right? This is 2010, 2013. We cannot be doing this. If I was in his situation, I wouldn't want this. And I said, okay, I'm going to go home, start pulling things together. A week later, I'll be able to, you know, go help the patient. Not the case. It takes years. It takes a long time to go from the prototype testing phase to actually get this to John, because that's the end goal, right? So my point is, on this journey, uh, there's, a, there's a few hurdles, but I think the end goal that a lot of us need to take into account or take into our minds is how can we help change lives, even on smaller steps, but think about the big picture and what it takes to actually get the whole spectrum done. I've been lucky to have a few people, uh, or a lot of people around me, who've been motivated to see the same cause, who see the end vision, who understand they can change lives, because you go through a lot of tough times, right? When you stick through this, then you can actually build something fun, something that really changes lives for John and for millions of other patients. And I think a lot of us, or all of us, need to be aware of the evolving landscape. Technology evolves rapidly, and technologies that were traditionally not a fit together could probably now work together very well, and we could probably build incredible applications. So I think it is, I think I really, I believe, I strongly believe that it's truly the time to literally bring collectively all our brains in the game. Thank you.